uh, glad you're here. Good to see the balcony crew up there. I want to say uh, thank you to those of you who hosted uh, some of the choir members in your home last night. Uh, we had a couple boys with us. Uh, I was telling them in the first service, they introduced us to Ethiopian music this morning. Uh, last night, I introduced them to bluegrass music. And uh, one of the guys came over to me and said, you know, I've never felt closer to the Lord than I did. When, no, he didn't really say that. But I was hoping he kind of would uh, when, the banjo, <laughs> when the banjo started. Uh, if you have your Bible, I want you to go to 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, just a follow-up to, uh, to last week. So a couple weeks ago, it had been kind of a long day, and it's about a little after 8 o'clock, and I went home, and I was trying to relax, kind of stressed out. And I kicked back in my favorite chair, and I turned on the Cincinnati Reds. Now, they were playing the St. Louis Cardinals on this particular night. And uh, if you're a baseball fan or a Reds fan in particular, you know that can either be really relaxing or really frustrating watching the Reds. More often than not, it's very frustrating watching them. But it, as we turned on the game, it was the middle of the game, and some, there were a couple outs that were made, and we came to the end of an inning, and then they went to a commercial break before they started the next inning. And it was then that as soon as it went to the commercial, Cannon, my three-year-old son, who was sitting on the couch over across the room from me, uh, he looked at me and he asked me this question. He said, Daddy, can you fast forward this or is this live TV? And I realized in that moment that my son is growing up in a world in which commercials, for the most part, are optional. I mean, you can DVR stuff, you can watch stuff on demand, and for the most part, it feels like commercials are just sort of disappeared. So, so here's Cannon, he's three-year-old. He's never going to have the experience of waiting all day for a 30-minute program to come on that turns out to be 21 minutes of commercials. Like you, I mean, we've all experienced that. That's a different world than the world that he lives in. And then I got to thinking about this. How is it that even though we live in a world in which commercials are optional, that it feels like we're drowning in advertising? So I looked it up this week. The average person sees anywhere from 4,000 to 10,000 separate ads per day, depending on your media habits. So you get on your phone, you're scrolling through a website, and you got direct mail pieces that come to your house. And the fact is that because of the, the sheer number, the volume of ads that we see, most of them get ignored. I mean, most of them go in one ear and out the other. But then every once in a while, there's, there's one ad, there's one commercial, there's something you see that just grabs your attention. So you see this, this piece of exercise equipment that you didn't know existed until that moment. And now it's going to help you get your six-pack abs back, you know, just like you were in college. Or you see something that's going to solve all your problems in the kitchen, and you get out your phone, you get on Amazon, and you order it immediately because it will not let you go. So how is it that there's some things that we ignore, and there's some things that we pay a whole lot of attention to? What's the difference between messages that land and those that get ignored? If you were here last week, we kicked off this series that we're calling next. And the idea behind it is everybody eventually thinks of what comes next. What happens after this life comes to an end? If you missed any of that, I hope you'll check it out on the app or, or on our website. But after the sermon was over last week, almost immediately on Sunday afternoon, my phone started buzzing and started getting emails. We had more downloads of that message than anything we've ever done. And there was one question that, that people kept asking. It was this, how can I get the people that I love, I mean, how can I get the people that I'm close to, to pay attention to this? Because I think this, this really matters. In a world in which people are drowning in information, they're exposed to 10,000 different voices every single day. How can we as a church and how can you, as an individual follower of Jesus, get the people that you love to pay attention to what's most important? 2 Corinthians 5, that's a question that Paul answers. Now, the first 10 verses of this chapter, Paul gives you a glimpse of what comes next. We talked about last week. Starts There's this moment of separation. You take your last breath on earth, and your soul separates from your body. That's followed by this moment of recognition in which you realize you're either in paradise or you're in prison. Paul said to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. So you immediately go into God's presence if you're a follower of Jesus. Then he talked about this conversation that you're going to have with Jesus about your, your life on earth. And again, if you missed that, I hope you'll check it out. But when you get to verse 11 of this same chapter, Paul's given us this glimpse of what's going to happen. And now he changes tones and he says, here's what you need to be doing now. In light of what comes next, 
Here's what you should be doing now. So if you are here last week, I read you this quote from C.S. Lewis. Here's what he said. He said, Christianity asserts that every individual human being is going to live forever. And this must be either true or false. Now, there are a good many things which would not be worth bothering about if I were only going to live for 70 years, but which I had better bother about very seriously if I'm going to live forever. If you're only going to live 70 years, a lot of things that don't matter. If you're going to live forever, there's a few things that are very serious. So what are those things? Paul talks about one of those things starting in verse 11. Here's what he says. Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope that it's also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we're in our right mind, it's for you. Now, verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So the word I want you to underline, the word I want you to pay attention to is that word compel. You might say it's Christ's love that drives us. It's Christ's love that, that motivates us or, or pushes us forward. It's Christ's love that causes us to work hard to persuade the people around us that they need to prepare for what's next. Now, you and I know we live in this world in which we're just bombarded with all kinds of advertising, comes in a lot of different shapes and forms. Most of it is, is digital now, but you still hear stuff on the radio, you get the newspaper out. And the people who, who study this will tell you there, there's one way of advertising that's by far the most effective, and it's decidedly old school. Here's what Seth Godin, a marketing expert, said. He said, the secret to marketing success is no secret at all. Word of mouth is all that matters. Now, you think back over your life, that's probably true. It's one thing to hear about, uh, you know, see an ad for a new restaurant. It's, it's something else to talk to somebody that you trust that just ate there. And yet, when we're talking about what comes next, when we're talking about being prepared for eternity, it's infinitely more important than any restaurant, any car, any house, any, any product. I mean, but here's the truth, and you know this is true. Most of us never actually get around to talking about it we think about it we might pray about it we make plans to talk about it but we rarely ever talk to anybody about it so here's the key truth that i think paul's driving home in this passage is this prepared people prepare people prepare people prepare people. In other words, Jesus, Paul says that, that once you've had an experience with Jesus in which you, you prepare for what comes next, it automatically becomes your job. You're, you feel compelled because of what Jesus has done for you to help the people around you also prepare. That's the way this, this whole deal is supposed to work. So how do you do that? Well, we're going to talk about this a lot over the next few weeks, but for today, there's just two quick things. Here's the first one. As you're helping other people prepare, it requires a consistent effort. Not a, every once in a while effort, but a, a consistent effort. Look at what he says in verse, verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So again, Paul says, once you've had an experience with Jesus, you become a new creation. Now, the part, there may be parts of the old life that pull you back, and there may be you know, some battles you have to go back and refight, but you become a new person. The old you is, is buried. You're adopted into a new family, but you're also given a new mission. The key word there that he uses is that word reconciled. To be reconciled means to take two opposing things that are not compatible and bring them together. You've heard the phrase irreconcilable differences. Two people just can't work together. And Paul says, at one point in your life, you were, you were separated from God. You were, you were an enemy of God. 
But because of what Jesus did on the cross, rather than pushing you away because of your sin, he brings you into his family. And now it's your job to help other people have that same experience. That's why in verse 18, Paul says that God has given us this ministry of reconciliation. And the Greek word that he uses there for ministry is a word that means task. It means it's, it's hard. When you're trying to reach the people in your family, when you're trying to reach the people that, that you work with and in your community, sometimes it feels harder than you think it should. Um, you would think, I mean, if you, if you offered somebody something that would solve their biggest problem, you would think they would automatically accept it. But if you've ever tried that, you know that's not true. So what do you do? What do you do when the people that you love don't seem interested what do you do when the people that you're trying to reach are not responding? I mean, what do you do when it gets discouraging and you feel defeated? It's simple. You keep giving the same effort. You continue to work at it. Galatians 6, Paul says it like this. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we'll, we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. You give up too soon or you get discouraged and you quit. You never reap the harvest. The harvest always follows the work. That's why you continue to give a consistent effort. Now, here's the second thing he talks about. In order to help people prepare for what comes next, it requires consistent effort and simple messaging. I can't stress this enough. It has to be a simple, a simple message. Check out verse 20 that he says here in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, we are therefore Christ ambassadors as though Christ were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Paul makes it clear. Once you understand this, once you have this experience, you automatically become an ambassador to the people around you. An ambassador is the highest ranking government diplomat sent from one country to another country to represent the interest of the home country. An ambassador is somebody that goes and lives in a foreign nation in order to represent the people that sent them. Paul says, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're an ambassador to the people around you. But one of the keys to being a successful ambassador is you have to learn that your job is not to push your personal agenda but it's to, it's to repeat the message that the home government gave to you. You go back in history, you'll find examples of ambassadors who said the wrong thing at the wrong time and started wars. So if you're going to be a successful ambassador in a foreign land, the key is to learn to speak with one voice and deliver one consistent message. So what's our message as a church? Well, if you hang around churches very long, you'll, you'll quickly realize that it sometimes feels as if we are experts at mixed messaging. We try to do so many different things that our primary message sometimes gets, gets lost in the shuffle. Let me give you an example. You go to church one weekend and somebody stands up and they say, you know, the key thing is to live a holy life and separate yourself from bad influences. The next weekend you come, the same person says, you know, the key thing is to build relationships with lost people and, and try to bring them to Christ. And you try to balance all that in your mind. Then somebody says, you know, the key thing is Bible study. Somebody else says it's all about outreach. Somebody says, uh, what we need to do is focus on family ministry. Somebody else says, no, it's all about missions or small groups or singles or reaching millennials or social justice or fighting against sin or taking back our country or feeding the hungry and on and on and on. We've got this huge list of things that we say are our primary thing. And in the, because of that, we sometimes get stuck and we're not very good at any of them. Let me show you a picture of a stop sign I saw recently. Uh, if you look at this closely, you'll realize there's, there's a disconnect there. The only thing for sure is that they want you to stop. But you can't go right, you can't go left, you can't back up, and you can't move forward. You talk about mixed messaging, this is it. And some people think when they come to church that that's our message. We say, hey, we got some stuff we want you to stop, but after that, we're not sure which direction you should go. And yet... As ambassadors of God, there's a simple message that Paul says we should be sharing, and it's this. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's the message. 
Our message is not, hey, clean up your act, be a better person, stop doing this, start doing that, uh, give more money, show up on the weekends, join a group. That, that's none of that. I mean, all that's important, but the, the key thing and always the primary message is be reconciled to God because if you get that right, everything else takes care of itself. If you don't get that right, then nothing else matters. That's why our number one priority as a church is people who are, who are trying to be prepared for what comes next, who are trying to help other people prepare for what comes next, is, hey, wherever you're at in your spiritual life, make sure you're reconciled to God. That's our message. Not our job to change it, not our job to, to soften it. Our job is to deliver it as consistently as possible. And another way to say it would be prepared people, prepare people. That's our message. Two questions. And then I'm done. Here's the first one. I want you to ask yourself, am I prepared? See, just like last week, it's one thing to talk about this, and, you know, next week we'll jump in about what happens on the judgment day and all this. And my suspicion is there's some of you here, and you hear this, and you think, that's great, but I'm not really prepared. If you look at what Paul says next, 2 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1, I want you to look at this. He says, as God's co-workers... We urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, for he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Anytime you see in the Bible where it talks about salvation, you know when it says you're supposed to do it? Now. It's always today. It's always now. It never talks about tomorrow. It never talks about, you know, some, some point in the future. And the reason that's true is because nobody's promised tomorrow. The only moment you're promised is now. So if you're unprepared, don't wait until some obscure moment in the future that may or may not happen. You need to prepare now. The other question is this one. If you are prepared... Are you doing anything to help other people get prepared? So I was thinking about Canaan asking me that question at the game a couple weeks ago. It caused me to have a flashback uh, to when I was a little kid. I would sit in this little living room with my grandpa, and we would always watch the Reds. And throughout the game, he would make comments, and, you know, here's what's happening. Here's why this is happening. Here's why what they're doing is not the right thing to do. Here's what they should be doing. And throughout the game, he would explain what was happening in the game. He wanted me to understand about baseball. He wanted me to prepare myself for a lifetime of, of watching baseball. Now, in later years, he would turn the game on, and he would immediately go to sleep every time. Just the first pitch, he'd go to sleep. And he would always wake up right when the ninth inning started. It didn't matter. I don't know how he did it. It's like he had an alarm clock inside of his head. First inning, go to sleep. Ninth inning, he'd be wide awake, and he'd tell you that he watched the whole game, which you knew was, was not true. But during those times, think back to those conversations, and we had some really important conversations. I can still remember some of the things he said during those times. I'm going to be honest with you. The most important conversations we ever had had nothing to do with baseball. They had nothing to do with your batting average or your GPA or your, your net worth or your job or your career opportunities. The most important conversations that we ever had had everything to do with being prepared for what comes next. Prepared people prepare people. And I hope that you're having some of those types of conversations with the people that you love. Matthew 9, Jesus said this. said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There's a, you look around, there's a lot of people that are unprepared, but there's very few that are working to prepare them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the morning we've had. We thank you for the weekend we've had. Thank you for the great conversations that took place. Thank you for the relationships that were formed. But Father, help us never to lose sight of the fact that our number one priority is to take people who are far from God, whether that's us or the people that we're closest to, and help them to be reconciled to you. Help them to be forgiven, to have an experience of your grace to be adopted into your family. 
And Father, we pray that you would give us the courage to have those conversations, that we wouldn't uh, chicken out when the moments come, but that we would be completely focused on the primary thing. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to stand. We're going to have just a brief invitation. Uh, if you're here uh, and you want to talk to somebody, you want to pray about something, maybe you're unprepared, you want to uh, ask some questions about what that would look like for you to get prepared, uh, Dave and I will be here. If you want to join the church, you say, you know, I've been coming for a while. It's time for me to join the team. Uh, we'd love to have you. You don't have to do anything weird. We're not going to make you say anything or do anything. Uh, we'll just, just come hang out in these front rows, and Dave and I will be here.